In episode two, John Kreese links up with Kim, and he's known her since she was a little girl. He learned how to do karate from her grandfather. So these two are old friends. But because John Kreese was behind bars, when Kim came over to help Terry Silver, he unfortunately didn't see her. She tells him that she came over to the States because she was blinded by the promise of bringing her grandfather's karate to the world, but that wasn't the case. And Kreese stops her and says, well, it still can be. Cobra Kai has earned a spot in the Saikai Taikai, so let's go win it. And while she would say yes, her grandfather, on the other hand, he's a different story, and Kreese is going to have to win him over. He pitches Master Kim on going to the Saikai Taikai as Cobra Kai, but Master Kim just says no. He starts blaming his granddaughter for the promises that she made when she left for America, the promises that she didn't keep because of Terry Silver. And he even gets pretty personal with his attack, saying, this is why you're never going to be a master. Kreese, however, continues to pitch Master Kim on the idea of going to the Saikai Taikai, but Kim laughs him off, and at one point he says, you were never a good student, in fact, you're not a good sensei. To which Kreese says, I'm not a good sensei. Well, did she tell you how one of my students dominated four of your students? And Master Kim actually likes this little bit of gumption, so he says, you know what, yeah, I'll give you a chance. He sends Kreese on a death mission to find his family knife. This knife is located deep in the jungle in a cave that's protected by a cobra. And when Kreese gets there, he tries to grab the knife, but the cobra strikes and bites Kreese. And the poison quickly starts to take effect. He starts to have a fever dream. It's as if he's Ebenezer Scrooge and he's visited by three ghosts, one of them being Terry Silver, the other one being a young Johnny Lawrence. A lot of soul searching going on in this fever dream. But after fighting off his demons... He heads back in that cave, he is able to get the knife, and he's even able to cut the head off the cobra, and he wins Master Kim's blessing. Now, as for life in the valley, it is college application season, and Miguel has his eyes set on Stanford University. He's written his letter, he's planning on doing early acceptance, but he also knows that he probably should prepare for a safety school. One of the reasons why is because Johnny and his mom, they're broke. The apartment they live in just had a little bit of an issue when a septic pipe leaked and burst into their living room. They currently don't really have a place to live. And it's not like you can get a Stanford education via Groupon. So Miguel, who wants to go to Stanford, and Demetri and Eli, who have aspirations of MIT, decide to go and check out the local college. And they happen to run into two old acquaintances, Kyler and Brooks. But the old bad blood that they had for one another is water under the bridge. Brooks and Kyler are actually happy to see Miguel, Dimitri, and Eli. So much so that they invite him to a frat party that night. Kyler's one of the pledges. And as Miguel, Dimitri, and Eli are enjoying the ambiance, they just can't believe that Kyler has seemingly landed on his feet. He seems to be owning this college. That is until they see how he's treated as a pledge. It's as if Miguel has never heard of Greek life. He's shocked at how poorly Kyler is treated, but yet also amazed at how he just accepts it. Miguel approaches Kyler and is like, dude, that's, that's really not cool what they're doing to you. But Kyler brushes it off and says, that's just the way they are, man. It's all right. Once I get into this fraternity, life will be good. Don't worry about it. But later on in the party, Miguel overhears two frat brothers say that they're not planning on inviting Kyler into the frat. They're really just using him as slave labor. And later that night, when they make Kyler eat food off the floor, Miguel steps in and says, Guys, tell him the truth. And that's when the fraternity brother tells Kyler, yeah, we had a good run, but there is no way we were ever going to allow you in this frat. When Kyler hears this, he tells him, you're lost. But then he dumps a beer on him. Because Kyler, knowing karate, knows he can kick this guy's ass, and he does. All of the karate kids start a brawl in this frat house, and shockingly, they all win. They wipe the floor with these frat boys. At the end of the night, Kyler and Miguel actually go and grab a bite to eat. And Kyler confides in Miguel that he had these goals and these dreams, but he didn't stick to them. And he really regrets slacking off in life. And his advice to Miguel is, the safety school is always going to be there. Chase after the dream school. The two of them, though, get interrupted by a couple of other Greek members, but these guys are nice. They overheard of what happened at the frat house, and they actually invite Kyler into their fraternity. Because, well... They could probably use his particular set of skills. As Miguel was going to check out safety schools, Johnny was trying to find him a place to sleep. That septic pipe damage is brutal. 
He heads on over to the LaRusa household and he tells them all about the burst pipe and how right now he's got a bunch of people crashing in his tiny little apartment and he's hoping to find something better. And Johnny suggests bringing Chosen because he watches all these shows like Selling Sunset and Property Brothers. So Johnny and Chosen spend the day trying to find Johnny a rental property and it does not go well. The first place they check out, Johnny loves, but he insults the realtor. And the second place they go, Johnny also likes, but it's the same realtor. And after the insult that Johnny gave him in the previous house, the realtor tells him, I'm never renting a house to you, ever. It's worth mentioning, this realtor is a dickhead. But he's also completely clueless on who Johnny Lawrence is. And as luck would have it, the guy who actually owns the house is well aware of Johnny Lawrence and the lore of the All-Valley Tournament. He watched Johnny win it years ago. In fact, he's actually kind of starstruck. Johnny pitches this guy on being the renter of his house, Unfortunately, Johnny's credit is horrible and he doesn't exactly have a punch of money. So the guy tells him, look, with a steady income and a solid deposit, I'll rent you a house. I have a couple of them. So let's just stay in touch. Now for Johnny, it's just a matter of finding a steady income, which he doesn't have. Later that day, he heads to Daniel's because he feels like he's owed some back pay for being a sensei and he wants Chosen's rate. He finds out that Chosen isn't paid. If they win the Saikai Taikai, he can get paid, but that's months down the line and he needs money and a steady income today. Daniel tells him maybe it's time he just does what he does and gets a 9 to 5, but the way that Johnny interprets that is that Daniel's offering him a job. So the next day he shows up in a suit and a tie and he's ready to work at La Russa Auto. Daniel, recognizing that Johnny's pretty hard on his luck at the moment, doesn't want to just turn him away. He wants to find him a job, but Johnny finds his own job. Because he ends up selling a car. And the person he sells it to gives Johnny a glowing recommendation. So the steady income appears to take care of itself because you're looking at the new sales associate at La Russa Auto, John Lawrence. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel and subscribing to my Patreon. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. If you left a comment, I don't get back to you. I usually don't check the comments unless they're like a super comment. Also, if you don't see the next video up on the end screen, not to worry, it'll be up in a day or two.